Um, now, our first speaker this afternoon is um, Mr. Richard Brown, who's a, a director of JIRA, which is a research and consultancy company with, I understand, a specialization in the meat and related industries. So, um, if you'd like to... Uh, thank you very much, Chairman, uh, for your introduction, and thank you very much to UNICH for inviting me here to speak about meat. And um, I spend my entire life studying the meat industry. I'm also a farmer from the south coast of England, where I'm stupid enough to have a suckler herd of cattle, and I produce hopefully decent quality beef and some lambs. And... Um, like many of my compatriot farmers in the United Kingdom at the moment, and I think in the EU and in many places, this is, a very, this is a very tough time for us this year. We're not enjoying ourselves. The prices are very low, and morale is rather low. Uh, the costs are still quite high. Even though the oil price has come down, the costs of production are troublesome. So morale in the farming sector is not very good. Anyway, I have the pleasure of giving you a light bombardment of data on the world meat market uh, for 25 minutes or so. So I hope that this will be interesting for you. And I would like to start off with an observation that this is a tough speaking slot. First session in the afternoon is what we in England call the graveyard slot for a speaker. And, um, and I'm sad to say that, um, that this year I seem to have occupied the graveyard slot with attendance to rather a lot of funerals, which I suppose is what happens to you when you reach sort of my great age, keep on having to go to funerals at about this time of the day, dressed in a dark suit and a white shirt, so I've dressed for the part. And normally people look rather somber at funerals, and you're not looking so somber, which is good. And um, you're also not looking that sleepy yet, which is good. And um, this, this sort of gives me a little excuse to cheer you up a little bit by telling a little joke. And it is absolutely a true joke of what happened to me in June. I... Um, had the pleasure of going to Waterloo in Belgium uh, the day before the, bi the bicentenary of the Battle of Waterloo. And, um, and for English people in the audience, we will understand the significance because the Battle of Waterloo was one of the three times in the last 300, uh, 200 years when um, the British have had good allies in Europe. Anyway, there I was in, um, in Waterloo uh, making a presentation to the subsidiary of a very substantial American firm. And um, um, there were about 15 people around the, around the table. And about 15 minutes into, the, um, into my speech, just as this chairman might do, the chairman, who was the American chief executive, said to me, Richard, just get on with it. And um, 15 seconds later, I, I sort of looked down at him, and the poor man had completely collapsed in his chair. He was utterly and completely unconscious in his chair. And my first reaction was, my goodness me, I have a bad reaction on this person. But um, anyway, the poor man had collapsed 15, seconds into my, 15 minutes into my speech. 15 minutes, 15 seconds of silence, while we were rather shocked, having observed the man had collapsed. <laughs> Fifteen seconds later, he was taken off his chair to the floor, where he lay absolutely horizontal. And 15 seconds later, his big boss from America thought it was appropriate to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. <laughs> and 30 seconds later, he sat bolt upright wiped his lips and said, what the hell's going on here? <laughs> anyway, 
um, I'm delighted to say that he survived and we went on and it was fine. But the, um, the bottom line of the, um, of the joke is be very careful about closing your eyes in the next 25 minutes <laughs> because the staff of Unich are well prepared to come and administer mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. <laughs> anyway, the chairman will say, get on with it, Richard. And so I will. On to my little, hopefully interesting observation of world meat markets, which is what I spend my time and my company spends our time studying, with a few sort of light observations of what that might mean for, for the tanner, tannery sector and for the leather sector. And in case I get lost in, um, in the complexity of my charts, let me just say that 2015 is a very tricky year for the meat industry, very volatile, all sorts of funny things happening, and somewhat disappointing in terms of the profitability for everybody, but certainly we feel very confident about the long-term growth of world meat demand, and that will also benefit the red meat sector, and there will be uh, a larger supply of meat, and to some extent that will result in more animals being slaughtered um, and in some changes in the quality of the hides and skins which come from those animals because I want to make clear that I'm expecting a further reasonably substantial intensification of livestock production so that to satisfy world meat demand we will have larger carcasses produced from animals which are younger and by obvious I implication, they have been finished more intensively, uh, with different implications for the quality of the hide and skin as well. So that's what I've got to say, and now I'm going to repeat it a couple of times through my slides. Um, I'm going to start off with making some observations about overall global meat demand, some observations about beef and sheep meat specifically, and then slightly repeat a few of my main points by making a few small vignettes on certain important countries in the world. So, 2015 follows two rather interesting years. It follows 2013, which for the meat industry was a year of production caution for one key thing, and that was that the cost of feed was so high. After the American heat wave of the summer of 2012, feed costs were incredibly high, and anybody in the business, whether they were chicken feeders, pig feeders, or intensive grain feeders of cattle, had to be extremely careful about how much they produced. So 2013, year of caution. Then came 2014, which was the year of contradiction. It was a very bad year in, in some places, such as the EU and China, but it was a spectacularly profitable year in some other places, and I'm thinking very particularly of the United States, where, because of a variety of reasons, there was tight supply in a year of robust meat demand, the meat prices went very high, the feed costs were coming down, and a lot of people made a lot of money in America last year, and that applies to a few other places, um, including Brazil. So in 2015, what we were expecting was better economic conditions and a year of consolidation, which would be pretty good for, uh, for the meat industry generally. Not as good as 2014 in most places, but a pretty good year. With modest um, growth in consumption, global consumption up 1.3%, um, but continued low feed costs, which was nice for the, for the livestock industry. So that's what we were expecting, and it's not turning out quite as good as that. Here's a little picture which shows uh, the rise of world meat consumption, and really, I just want to point out that it's going up. It's not going up by very much. These are lower rates of growth than we would have seen historically. And I just want to make very clear that the big winner is the chicken industry, growing at twice the rate of growth of pork meat and, um, and the red meat sector particularly 
beef um, actually slightly lower production this year is what we were expecting. So people eat more meat, they eat more chicken, the big beneficiary. And to bang home the point, with low feed costs, there is an opportunity for the chicken industry to expand even more dramatically than this this year. They are, they are benefiting from lovely low feed costs and nothing motivates a chicken farmer more than that. If we look at world trade, um, uh, we're looking in meat, we're looking at a 2% growth in trade. The big winner again is chicken and chicken byproducts particularly, especially from uh, the United States. Well, it would have been that um, had they not had certain problems. Some recovery of the pork trade um, with, with the American industry recovering and a, actually a, a, sm a small decline in the beef trade this year, but after a very good year in which Indian buffalo growth grew very strongly. Now turning on to the cattle herd, you can see all these lines look rather flat. Um, I am not showing India on this chart. The Indian herd is way up here at 330 million. Um, then the next biggest herd is in Brazil and so on down to China. These graphs for the herd size, without bo bothering you with the detail, are rather flat. The farmers are, res are, are not responding to higher beef prices by having a lot more animals if you look at it over a long period of time. Production, the figures are actually quite dramatically different. The top producer of beef in the world is the United States, even though if we go back to the previous chart, if we look at the herd size, it's right down here. America has a massively more productive and intensive industry than, um, than, than anybody else in the world. And really what we need to look at is this line here. There is absolutely a very dramatic decline in American beef production through the last two years and will probably continue into next year as well. And that reflects the fact that they have had low profitability in the industry for quite a long period of time and some really poor grazing conditions for several years um, back here. And as a result, the, the number of slaughter cattle is way down and production is way down. And this is really important in the biggest market in the world for beef. Um, and it is the, really the striking feature of that little graph. The other little line I'll just draw your attention to is India here. Here you see a, a sort of pretty steady increase in the rise of Indian uh, uh, beef production, which is very predominantly from the slaughtering of, um, of buffalo, and their production has risen to serve export markets. Looking at trade, I won't bore you with the detail. This just shows the trade in beef, 10 million tons carcass weight equivalent. There are a couple of points I want to make. America is a very big importer. And if you look at this orange line here, this orange bar here, this is China. China has powered into the world meat trade as a very major import destination for beef. And by looking at this little chart here, you can see the rise in Chinese production. And what I just want to say is it's rather interesting to see two things. One is China is importing beef from quite a wide variety of origins. And secondly, more of those origins are being licensed for direct trade into China rather than having to go through the gray route um, through Hong Kong and through Vietnam and even through Thailand. So China is absolutely becoming a very major determinant of what happens to overall demand for beef, import demand for beef, and therefore the price. If there's a big downturn in China and they suddenly stop importing so much beef and so much lamb and so much mutton, then there'll be a very severe price impact. And we haven't seen that in beef so far this year, but there are some concerns in the sheep market, which I'll get to in a moment. The other one to flag on this chart is Russia. This is, these are the imports of beef into Russia over a reasonable time period. And you can see that it's about a million tons. It's a very significant market. It's one-tenth one of world trade. And Russian, these were our forecasts for Russian imports this year. We thought there might be some recovery. We were hopelessly optimistic. Um, and also, uh, things in Russia deteriorated just prior to us making these forecasts. But Russian forecasts of beef are way down, 
way down, probably be more like six or 700,000 tonnes this year rather than a million tonnes. So we've got, we've got a major disruption to the beef trade because of the problems in Russia. And I'll just repeat the Russian story a little bit later on. Turning to the exporters of beef, um, the, the figures I, figure I want to show you here, here is India absolutely powering into the world beef trade as a very major exporter of buffalo meat, which is the cheapest bovine meat in the world, and they are significantly harvesting more of the buffaloes that wander around India and then exporting them. There's consumption has been in decline because the export prices are so much more attractive than the import prices. So what's happening in India has a very major, and what may happen in the future, has a very major impact upon how the whole of the beef, beef industry around the world grows and reacts in the future. And the last point on this chart, um, which I want to draw your attention to, is Australia. In Australia, because of um, drought conditions in 2013, deteriorating in 2014, there was a very heavy rate of slaughtering. Very nice time for the abattoirs because they had a fantastic number of farmers who were very desperate to destock and their slaughterings were high. Um, and they were exporting beef into a very strong world market. They made a lot of money. We were expecting pasture conditions to improve in 2015 and for slaughterings to go down. Well, that hasn't happened so far. In the first part of the year, the drought continued and slaughterings have stayed at a high level. So, one bounces to the conclusion that as soon as there is reasonable rainfall in the important parts of um, Australia in cattle country, there will be a downturn in slaughterings and, um, and, and obviously in hide supply. Sheep I'm going to shoot through very quickly. China is really important um, in terms of production. This, this um, is China, according to Chinese statistics, absolutely way higher than the next lot down here, which is the Middle East and North Africa, way higher than the EU down here. China is absolutely incredibly important for the sheep production and consumption, and as we shall see again, it has suddenly become extremely important for world trade and therefore world prices in sheep meat. So here we turn to the little figure for exporters and we see that the trade is, in, is extremely concentrated in, uh, from Australia and New Zealand, absolutely dominate the world supply of interregional trade in, um, in lamb meat, and it's very similar for mutton, slightly the other way around, but it's very similar. The supply of, of lamb and mutton from Australia is, is peaking because um, of drought conditions there, and we were expecting the supply to come down this year. Then when we turn to the importer figure, you can see how China has charged into being a, being a place where where nearly a third of world sheep meat is dispatched in terms of trade. Absolutely. And if it, I, I've lost 2011 off the chart, but if we went back to 2011, it hardly featured. So China is really, really important. And China is importing from both Australia and New Zealand. This is for lamb. If it was mutton, it would be the other way around. <laughs> and from a variety of other people, including Uruguay, the number of European slaughterhouses are getting very interested in sending product there. It's byproduct, but it's also some meat. China is important. And it seems that for 2015, whilst the volume of imports hasn't been too bad, um, they've been very aggressive on prices and they're down trading slightly in the type of uh, meat which they're importing. So not a very encouraging signal for the, for the sheep industry. And one of the factors which has taken lamb prices down this year from where we thought they would be. Now on to a chart just talking about the meat processing industry, uh, the abattoirs I'm talking about here. This, is, this data is a little bit out of date. I'm not too worried about it. What I want to make is two or three simple points. As you know, the red meat industry particularly, but that's what you're interested in, it is... It is a very fragmented business. It's generally national operators at, at best. It's not an international business, really. That's how it's been for 100 years. 
Um, there have been some big companies which have emerged on the world stage. They've mainly been American. And over the last five years, they have substantially become Brazilian. And there is one company which is absolutely incredibly dynamic in acquiring in the meat industry, and that is JBS. And I'm surprised that I haven't heard those three letters so far today, because JBS is now by far the world's biggest meat company. It is a multi-species species operator. It has operations all over the world. And last year, it was profitable in very nearly all of them. It had a very, very good year. And although the chief executive said in March that now was a period of consolidation of the many acquisitions that it had made, two months later, it actually went out and spent another $3 billion in buying some very big meat businesses. One was the Moy Park chicken business in Europe, and the other was, was the um, pork division of Cargill in the United States. So two more very significant acquisitions, uh, which make JBS by an even wider margin uh, by far the most important meat company in the world. OK, now on to a little sort of sum up of 2015, how it's going compared with our forecasts. Slightly weaker economic growth than we were expecting. The oil price has crashed. That is really incredibly negative for Russia and for Russian GDP performance and for the spending power of Russian people and for what they can afford to spend on meat and for what they can afford to import. And the currency has collapsed and that is another factor which has led to a very sharp downturn in, in Russian meat imports. Um, I think we're looking at a figure of, of not a lot over a million tons this year in total, which is way down from the four million tons which it was five or six years ago. Uh, we also have a problem in Brazil with um, the economy slowing down and, and um, a troublesome year for, for many in Brazil. We have a slowdown in China, so these are, these are quite worrying conditions. They sum up to weaker meat import demand than we were expecting. Meanwhile, production um, is probably a little higher than we were expecting because of low feed costs and, and a recovery of the American chicken industry and also their pork industry. So production will go up, net effect of all that, down come the meat prices. Down comes profitability in many instances, and um, not terribly good news for the red meat sector. And this chart of currency just absolutely flags. It's indexing uh, a number of important currencies against the US dollar. Uh, and uh, you can see absolutely dramatic volatility in currency um, over the last year and particularly um, since December. And, um, and that has absolutely an implication for everybody, um, producers all over the world in terms of relative competitiveness and upon trade. This is the chart for uh, grain prices and and the, f and the grain price outlook is downward. There is, I can't find an, uh, an international grain analyst who is anything but bearish about the price of grain for the, for the year ahead. We've had a big harvest in, north, in the Northern Hemisphere again, in many places, particularly the United States, although there's still some way to go, and uh, grain prices are very low. Therefore, feed prices are low, good for the grain feeders, chicken, pig industry, and for certain people in the cattle sector. And the motivation to feed cattle more grain in these market circumstances is quite high. The beef price is still quite respectable. The grain price is low. Put it into the cattle. And there aren't so many cattle about, so some of the feedlots have had to pay an awful lot of money for their feeder cattle. So they can make more value out of those cattle by making them bigger and heavier. And this is exactly what's happening um, in several places around the world and well illustrated by the United States, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, my last sort of general chart um, shows what's happened to the producer price for various meats, for the main meats around the world. It's in local currency and it's um, having taken away the effect of inflation. And you can see what's happened to the real price of beef in local currency. It has gone up very strongly indeed because we're quite short of beef supply around the world. Farmers historically have not made enough money in cattle. The temptation to plough up 
decent grassland and put it into arable has been strong. It's happened in many parts of the world. And, the, and with reasonable beef demand around the world, the price has gone up encouragingly. So we have a high price of beef. We have um, a plummeting price of pork, especially um, with more supply in America this year. And, um, and we have rather a big discrepancy between the beef price and um, the monogastric price of chicken and, and uh, pig meat. Anyway, the story I want to tell here is that that real price increase, that real producer price increase, is quite encouraging and motivating for farmers around the world. If we went back into the 1990s, the real prices were going down and down and down. We are in a cycle now when the real prices have, have been upward and there's been much more dynamism and motivation um, amongst the farming community. It's not so good at the moment, but um, it's, it's had a reasonable run. America, high retail prices. Here we have the beef price relative to the pork price, which is coming down. You can see high prices, quite motivating for wholesalers, processors, and, um, and for farmers who are enabled to have a few more cattle because the weather conditions in the United States have been much better this year. And you can see from these charts that the crop conditions have been very good in 2015, 14, 13. We've had some big harvests and also the pasture and raise conditions and range conditions are much better. So American farmers who suffered some extremely poor grassland conditions for several years in a row and even if they wanted to have more cattle, they could not, their pastures would not carry more cattle. Now we have growing conditions in most of the US, most of the important part of the US, which make it possible for them to restock. And it's one of the factors which has contributed to the decrease in slaughterings this year and, um, and, um, and the decrease in supply. And what I said, uh, a, a movement which has happened at the same time, is that the carcass weight of these animals has shot up. This is the figure for 2015, strongly up upon prior years. And you can see here a very long-term trend since 1960 of raising... Uh, carcass weights and and um, okay I move on on to Russia very quickly Russia we've been really worried about how the consumers would react to their disastrous economy and the much much weaker ruble the net effect is this shows per capita consumption the net effect for 2015 is that they're going to be eating more chicken they're not and that's because and that is because a lot more chicken is being produced in Russia and a lot more pork is being produced in Russia. And that is exactly the strategy of President Putin. And he's using uh, the political bans and the currency situation to help reinforce an absolutely clear strategy for much greater levels of self-sufficiency in um, the Russian meat industry. And it's happened in pork. It's happening in... Uh, it's happened in poultry, it's happening in, in pork, and it's much slower in beef. The imports have absolutely crashed, um, even for beef where they are reliant upon imports, uh, they can't afford to import it. And this chart shows the balance table for Russia. This is, um, this is what's happened to consumption. Consumption has come down because they can't afford to import it. Move to China, we're really worried about the economy, and I'll just take the main point here. It leads to a situation of weaker meat import demand, and it's a bit worrying for many of the meat industry around the world who are becoming rather more reliant upon exporting byproduct and also, and also some cuts of meat into the Chinese market. And I turn to the beef balance table here for, for China. This shows what's happened to consumption. It's risen quite strongly. And it was this surge in imports which enabled the Chinese to eat more beef. We are sort of feeling long term is that this should be reasonably robust. And we're going to find out whether we're right in the next year or so with, 
with Chinese economic conditions being um, somewhat, um, somewhat uh, weaker than were forecast. We move to India. Here you can see uh, the, the, the growth of production. It's way lower than the American production, way, way lower. But, but with higher bovine prices around the world, the Indians are motivated to go and harvest many more of the male buffalo calves, which have before been wasted, and um, they are exporting them. That's what's happening to them. And although the government is not so happy about the importance of this emerging and quite, um, and quite um, visible uh, beef industry, uh, this is what's happening in India, a major source of bovine meat around the world. Off to Brazil very quickly. Um, Brazil, eco economy in trouble, plummeted exchange rate. This is the prices, these are pr the producer prices for cattle, for pork and for chicken. And we can see even with um, a weaker real that we've got troubles in the Brazilian market. The Brazilian pork price has plummeted. When you put it into US dollars, the figure is even worse. I mean, it's absolutely horrific, this price for the Brazilian pork industry. And even for the cattle sector, this is not, this is, this is a, this is a worrying time. It should be highly competitive in export. Some problems with the export markets at the moment. All is not well in Brazil. Now, the other little characteristic of Brazil, which I want to flag, and then I'm going to be near my conclusion, here is a pretty picture of a young Nelore bull, which has been the mainstay of Brazilian beef production for a very long time. And he's rather angular. He hasn't got a hell of a lot of meat on him. And, um, and um, he's not eating terribly high quality forage. And just around the corner is a fairly new feedlot, uh, which you can see here is substantially white. So my first point is, it's absolutely definitely possible to feed a very large number of young bulls in a small space um, effectively and to make money out of it. And then the next thing which they do is to do a little cross-breeding and turn your purebred Nelore into an Angus cross Nelore. And it's absolutely visually incredibly evident that there is a huge amount more meat on that carcass than there is on that carcass. And with low feed prices, feed costs, there is quite a motivation to do exactly that. And then with the long-term outlook for the world, meat demand for, and beef demand, there, is, there are many people who are interested in doing this. And the uptake in Brazil has been quite modest so far because the cattlemen are extremely conservative and cautious. But this is where we're going. And it's not just Brazil I'm talking about. There will be more intensive management of cattle to produce uh, beef for the world market. And very clearly, that will have an implication for hide supply, both because you don't need so many of these to, to um, produce the beef that people want to eat, but also because that hide will have different characteristics to that hide. And that's the way we're going. Australia, I've already said, is in drought, and, and I just will make two closing comments, one on Europe, and then I'll get to my conclusion. Here is, um, here is Europe. Even though we've had a horrible recession since 2008 and the global financial crisis, our meat consumption has held up pretty well. It's absolutely clear that we mainly eat pork. We're moving to eating more chicken, but the beef consumption has held up pretty well bearing in mind the state of the economy and also bearing in mind that the prices have gone up quite strongly because the world has been short of beef. I just want to flag another rather important thing in the minds of anybody in the meat industry in Europe and that is that our retailers are not having a very nice time and I've chosen to illustrate it with the share price for Tesco which has absolutely been one of the world's most successful grocery retailers over the last 30 years. This is what's happened to their share price. They have absolutely had a whole range of problems, which is really rather serious for us all, because one of the things that 
people like that do when they're having a nasty time is to put more and more pressure on their suppliers and squeeze more and more margin out of their suppliers. And that's exactly what they're doing. Now, my concluding slide, just to sum up, and thank you for bearing with me in a more or less conscious state. My message from the, from the meat sector is broadly positive. We've got glowing, growing global meat demand, especially in the developing world. Unfortunately for you and for me, it's mainly for chicken. But we're absolutely looking at the prospect for good red meat demand growth from around the world, especially into markets such as China, which have been quite vibrant. And that will pull production growth. Our view is that a good part of that production growth will be through intensification rather than bigger herds. And that that will lead to some interesting changes in both the quantity of hide and skin supply and also the quality of these hides and skins because they will be from younger animals which have probably not been subjected to so much um, sort of damage and, and also all these animals are going to be fatter and, um, and I'm quite sure that will make quite a difference to the characteristic of the hide and skin. So on that note, may I thank you very much indeed for your attention and um, I'm very happy to have a chat about meat and about hides and skins um, any time after, after this. So thank you very much indeed.